Well, God is good all the time, and there is power in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to be ministering today on the, the gospel of power, and the reason why it's the gospel of power is because of Jesus, and Jesus is the gospel. I think one reason why we don't see sometimes the power exhibited is because in so many churches across our land, there's another gospel being preached. There's additions to the gospel. They leave things out sometimes because they don't want to offend somebody or hurt somebody. But uh, when the gospel is presented and preached, whether it's from a pulpit, whether it's from you sharing over a cup of coffee at Starbucks, but when you share Jesus, it's powerful. When you share the word of God, it's powerful. And it will change lives, amen? It will bring people to a knowledge, saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we want to look at this this morning, but could we just begin with prayer? And uh, Father, I thank you for your goodness to your people. Lord, today as I share this word, it's primarily a word that is meant for the church, for the people of God to, to bring once again an awareness of just how powerful this gospel is. And in the day and age in which we live, we need a powerful gospel, Lord. We need everything that you have given us at our disposal, Lord, to reach out to this lost and dying world and bring people into the fold, bring them to Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray, open our ears for those who may be watching online. To those who don't even know you yet, Lord, I pray that Jesus today you would be revealed to those who do not yet know you, that they would sense and know the power and the presence of a mighty Savior in this place and in our hearts and our lives. And we give you the praise, we give you the glory. And all, all the people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Well, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 is where we will begin and, and uh, where we will end today, actually. And uh, most of the scriptures, or maybe one or two, I'll try to... Remember which ones those might be and tell you they're not on the, over, on the PowerPoint, but uh, you can write those references down if you want to at the time. But, but the gospel of power, let's just read just Romans 1.16 to begin with today. And it says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And, and therein is one of our first problems. Some people are ashamed of the gospel. They wouldn't say that, but they are because they try to change it. They try to make it different to fit what they want it to fit, either their life or if they're trying to share the gospel with someone else, they want to change it because it might be offensive to them as if, if it's presented as it is. Uh, it's a gospel of peace, but the gospel also will bring division because when people reject Christ, the only hope that they have, it brings division in households, in a nation, and, and anywhere we go. But he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because... That because is an important word. He said, it is the power of God. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Now, there are many gospels being preached today, but only one gospel has power. Only one gospel has the power to save you and to keep you, amen, and present you faultless before Jesus Christ on that day. Only one gospel. He wants to save us from sin's penalty, and yes, thank God, when we receive Christ, we're saved from the penalty of sin that we all, all of mankind was due that, that penalty, and yet Jesus died on that cross. He shed his blood, he gave his life, but he rose again. I mean, that was important too, to the fullness of the gospel, that we might be saved from our sins, sins we've already committed, sins of the past. But, but he also is a gospel of power that saves us from the power of sin. The power of sin. How many know that we got saved? We said we meant it. We, we, we truly got saved. We truly accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. We, we did everything that we needed to do at that time. But how many know the devil doesn't quit working on us trying to get us to go back to the old place again? Back into the dominion of darkness. But Jesus said, I set you free from the dominion of Satan, from the dominion of darkness, and I've seated you together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're no longer part of the devil's domain. You belong to Christ Jesus now. You are his child. 
Amen? And so I say that to say because some of the Gospels preached today take it pretty easy on sin. Oh, it's no big deal. God understands about all these little nuances that we have, and, and nobody's perfect. And it's true. Nobody's perfect. It's true. We've all, even we preachers, have sinned since the day we got saved or whatever day we got saved. We've messed up. But we've had to go back and repent and ask God's forgiveness for that sin and ask Him to forgive us. And we have to understand that the sin is, is, is a powerful tool that destroys the work of God in your life if you don't deal with it correctly and and if you don't take it seriously and understand that sin is a serious problem and then he also saves us uh, from satan's domain you know the, the, the devil doesn't mind if we're religious he doesn't mind if we go to church every sunday really if we're not living the life or if we're under some bondage of sin still in our life jesus says I died for you, and the gospel, when it's preached in, in its fullness and in its power, it will set you free from the sins of the past. It will set you free so you don't continue down and living the way you used to live. But now you're free to live free in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm free to obey His commands because I love Him, because I seek Him, because I have a relationship with Him, and He speaks to me day by day. Amen. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a freeing thing. Some people even just recently were helping a neighbor yesterday or the day before dig out a fence post and put a new one in and it was like a four-hour job right, digging all that concrete out of the old post uh, the new post was pretty easy once we got there but but he said something he said you know ben this is so tiny i probably had you come over and have a beer with me but i know you probably wouldn't do that you know you, and uh, usually when they say that it's like they they tack on because your denomination or your church or or somebody else and i have to always say if that is the case say no it, it may be that my denomination that my affiliation with a certain church says that i can't do that or shouldn't do that but i don't do that because i choose not to i choose not to i choose there's a lot of things i choose not to do that i feel free maybe i could do in some cases but because i live for a higher calling amen i don't want to even delve into something that makes smack of evil or something that has caused so much evil in our society and in our world i just soon lay it aside and not touch it and not have anything to do with it so nobody i didn't want my own kids to be raised in a house where there was alcohol in the house and they could say well daddy did it you know daddy had it why couldn't i i wanted them not to be able to say that I want that example to be there before them. And, and, and the power of the gospel brings us from where we're at today, where it's all about me all the time. You know, that's people that's, it's me, 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 and my, it's my stuff. And what's, what about me? To caring more for others. We reach out. It's others first. It's Christ first, others. Amen. And we give our life. We sacrifice some things that we could do that we might want to do. We don't do them for the betterment of others who may be watching us, who are weaker than we are in their faith and would cause them to stumble and they fall. And so I say, this is the power. This is the gospel we're talking about. That, that word there, power, is dunamis. It, it means force. It means miraculous power or ability or abundance, meaning might, mightily, mighty. Uh, you're, you're a worker of miracles or miracles and power and strength and violence, mighty, wonderful works. And might I see, say, say, say you today that in the world that we're living in, right here in the United States of America, it, it's going to take a mighty, powerful gospel. It's going to take that powerful gospel to break down the chains of darkness that so many are bound with. So many who once knew the Lord has walked away from, from the Lord and they're bound in their sh shameful, sinful acts. But the power, the power of the gospel can break through. The power of the gospel can bring hope where there is no hope. The power of gospel causes us to rise up against the lie of the devil who says, you'll never overcome this. Say, you're wrong, Satan. You'll, you'll, I will overcome this. Not because of who I am, because of my own power, my own willpower it's not that it's the power of the holy spirit working in me and you have the power of the holy spirit working in you through the power of the word of god amen which is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword it can change you it can mold you it can transform you you can live for christ you can live godly let me say something we we know that god is a god of love i grew up in it but god i thought growing up because it was hellfire and brimstone all the time pretty much and so i was looked at god more like he's up there watching for me to blow it and mess up but uh uh, but it's not true. But God is still a holy God. You'll still find more than anything else in the Bible when it refers to him. It's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Don't my people recognize that I am a holy God, he would say to the children of Israel. He's still saying to the church of today, don't you realize I'm a holy God and you need to be a holy people if you're going to represent me in the face of the earth. And so we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the gospel if we're going to be the people that God intended us 
is to be to reach this world with the gospel. Dunamis, that word is used 70 t- 72 times in the New Testament. And uh, I wonder, I don't know, maybe when they use the word dunamis, which is more, you think, probably in way back when they think dynamite was the most powerful thing they could think of. I think of dunamis, and I think atomic bomb. <laughs> and that's still, that doesn't even begin to say what God could do. You know, God is so powerful. But but it gives you a little bit of idea. But 72 times it's used in the New Testament to describe it describes either God's unlimited power, keep it in mind, unlimited power, God's unlimited power in Jesus through Jesus Christ, His Son, or God's unlimited power in us. How many know that same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead is the same Spirit that dwells in you and in me if you're full of the Holy Spirit? Amen. It's the same Spirit. And also it's used talking about Satan's lying wonders, but they are limited in power. The Satan is powerful, but he's not all-powerful. But he's more powerful if you want to fight him on your own flesh and blood strength, you're going to be had. <laughs> That's why you need Jesus. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's why you need the power of the gospel. You need to know the word. You need to be a student of the word. You, you may never preach and stand as I'm preaching here today. You may never uh, be in academics. But, but listen, you can all know the word. And I'm convinced of this. If we'll just read the word, if we'll be students of the word, it's amazing how many times you could be reading anywhere. You could be reading in Leviticus, it seems like, and God will bring you in contact with somebody who you have the answer for their question because you were just reading it that morning. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that's the other thing that's a power. God knows your life. God has a plan for your life. And he has a plan for us to be the church that reaches out and touches people with the gospel. The true gospel, not just on Sunday morning in a pulpit or in a church house or a Billy Graham crusade or something. Every believer needs to be preaching the gospel, needs to be sharing the gospel. In the early church, that, that's what happened. When they were scattered, it says they went everywhere preaching the gospel. I think sometimes we lock that in and think that was just the apostles, just the original. It was everyone was preaching. Everyone was sharing Christ. Amen. It's a powerful thing. And, and it, will, it will excite you. I don't believe there's anything that get, should get a Christian more excited than leading another person to Christ. Amen. That is so exciting. You know, we, we believe that it's good to have families and to have babies. And babies are cool. Everybody loves babies, right? And and uh, But we need to have baby Christians and be excited about the babies that are being birthed in the church. Amen. The newborn believers. And the gospel will do that. The gospel will do that. Now, there's just, it's not on your PowerPoint. I think Luke 4, 14, if we went on, it says, uh, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, that is Jesus. Remember, after he was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended, the Father spoke from heaven, and it says the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He was there, and that's where Satan tempted him, tried to get him to uh, to uh, to do what was wrong, and what he knew he shouldn't do, and, and Jesus refuted him. And what did Jesus speak to him? He spoke to him what? The Word, the Word, the Word, the Word of God. We need to know the Word, so when we speak to the devil, when he tries to get us to, to, to to fall for his temptations, we speak the word. It's not my words that matter. It's not your words. It's the word of God that matters. And we speak the word to him and say, no, Satan, I will not do that. I will not follow that direction. Get behind me, devil. That's his position. Did you know that's the devil's position? It isn't out here tempting us. We need to, he's, he tempts us. He wants to, but we say, hey, get behind me. I don't even look at you. <laughs> Stay back there where you belong. You know, you don't belong in the front. You're not the leader anymore. I follow Jesus Christ. He's the one I'm looking at. He's the one my eyes are fixed on. Not you, Satan. Not you. But the Word says, He is my author. He's the finisher of my faith. And I look to Jesus Christ alone. Well, back in a, back in a day around 1980, uh, I bought a 1980 Volkswagen diesel rabbit. I bought it because we were pastoring a little church in eastern Oregon. Finances were pretty low, and we needed something that got lots of mileage because my hospital visits were 250 miles to Portland, 180 miles to Boise, Idaho, or 55 miles to Walla Walla, Washington. And I found my time myself at times didn't have enough to put gas in the car to go. So we bought a rabbit, and, and I love that rabbit. I love the 45 miles a gallon, and it seems to get 45 whether you're pulling a load or whether you're just... Uh, by yourself, it's 45, 45 was pretty much that. as before turbo charges. But I found out something that really bothered me. It had no power. I mean, if I was going to pass somebody, and we went back and forth in New Mexico many times in those days, trying to keep our kids connected with relatives back in Texas and New Mexico, and that was like 1,600-mile trip one way. 
and I'd find myself trying to pass a truck, and my and if I was passing a truck on a two-lane road, what I'd have to do is back off, actually, and watch until I thought it looked like there's enough room ahead of him, nothing's coming, no curves, and then I'd build up my speed to go around him, because once I got in, around him halfway, if a car showed up, I only had one choice. I couldn't push the gas and go any faster. I had to just slam on the brakes and pull back in. And uh, I, I didn't like that feel of that. I, I, I wanted that power. How many of you have ever made a mistake? Some of us misjudge, don't we? And, and I, I needed the power to get on around and, and to keep my family safe. And my wife, she, I'm glad she's not up here helping me preach. She said, he shouldn't have tried it to begin with. He should have just stayed behind the truck. <laughs> But we're not created. God says, he says, I want you to move forward, church. Amen. I want you to be powerful. And I'm going to give you all that you need to be that powerful church. So, so here's, here's Jesus. Let's get back to the scripture. Jesus is, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's been tempted of the devil. And it says that he returned in the power of the spirit when he came back. And he came to Nazareth. Remember, he didn't do a lot of miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief. And that's where he was from. And so they said, who is this? Didn't he grow up around here with us, you know? But uh, here's what it said. He came to the synagogue and, uh, in Nazareth. And uh, after he'd come back in the power of the Spirit, and he said this, he said, the, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, as he opened the scroll and began to read. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. We have a lot of poor among, and, and the Scripture tells us the poor will always be among us. We'll never have a time when there's not some poor among us. But he said, he sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. I'm so glad, I'm so glad you don't have to be an elite to have the gospel. I'm so glad you don't have to be in the top echelons of society or culture, or you're just down here. I've been to India, and one of the most tragic things to me is, because even though they don't still do the caste system, they say, it still, it still is a part of what drives how they live. And uh, the one place we particularly went, it was in my heart to go with Brother Joy, was to, to the, uh, the tribal areas, and most of those are in the, would be in the delete caste, they're the low caste. And the tragedy is, is they, don't, they, they don't believe they should even try to better themselves, because this is what they are, this is what they were meant to be. And if they try to better themselves and they, and they mess, mess things up, they might come back as a cockroach next time instead of something better in the next life. And so they don't even try. They don't believe that they can have something better. They don't believe that and it goes that way. The gospel, they don't believe this could be for me. That's just for the, for the rich people. That's for the big people, the good people, the nice people, the people who have things. No, no, the gospel is for the poor. The gospel is for whosoever will may come and drink freely of the word of God at the fountain of life. Amen. And so I, I say, God, help us to understand that. He said, Jesus said, the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. Any of those things, you, you know anybody that's in that category? Maybe you're in that category today, whether you're here, whether you may be listening online, or you may listen to this message some other time. He said, I, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand, I want to release you from your oppression. And he proclaimed, this is the, name, the day or the year of the Lord's favor. Hallelujah. I want to say to you that from that day that Jesus proclaimed that to this day, amen, it hasn't diminished one iota. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He's still the same. Jesus has the same power, and he's given us and filled us with his Holy Spirit. Amen. He's given us the power. He's given us the authority to use that power. It's one thing to have power, but to have the authority to use that power is something else. But all power and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ. There's no other authority above him. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit work together. The devil is not the all-powerful authority. Sometimes it seems like we act as if he is the authority. He's not the authority. And may I say to you, we don't realize how much when you serve Jesus Christ and you love Jesus, you may feel like I'm the least of all Christians. But when you serve Jesus and you let your light shine, it pushes back the powers of darkness. It pushes back the gates of hell that said, you remember Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, my church, that I will build. I will build my church, Jesus said. And so we push back. When we push back, when we push back through the power of the Holy Spirit alive in us, we push back through the word that we preach, that we share, that we share. People 
may even reject it. They may walk away, but it still penetrates their hearts. We need a gospel of power in America today. It's going to take a gospel of power to turn this society around, to turn people around, and turn them to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we could do it with homiletics or, or apologetics along, it would have already been done because there's great guys that can refute all the worldly guys that try to say, no, God didn't create the earth and all these other things. History, history proves it. The Word of God, even if they go back and they take the Word of God, and often the, the brain heads have to go back to the Word of God to find out what happened. And say, oh, yeah, yeah, because this Word is true forever and forever and forever. It stands forever. It's so powerful, amen, that when we speak it, sometimes it may seem like it wasn't effective, but every time you speak, every time you share into somebody's life, even if they reject you, it may be the next one that shares with them that suddenly the light comes on, and they not only remember what was being told them at the time, but the light comes on, they remember remembered what you said two weeks ago, or two months ago, or two years ago, and the Holy Spirit takes all that and begins to work in their hearts. The power of God begins to work in their hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God, and they're transformed, they're changed forever, forever changed, and set free from the God of this world. Amen. In Acts chapter uh, 1, verse 5 through 8, says, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had met together, they asked him, that is Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but, huh, we always need to see what's after the but or the if. I, I, I started this year going around just circling if, 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 everywhere. So, and, and often God makes promises and says, if you will, I will. And we, don't, we need to pay attention to our end of the bargain because God always will keep his end. If things break down in communication, or problem, it's not because God got something wrong. It's because I got something wrong or forgot to do something that I needed to do to receive what he has for me. He says, but you will receive power. Why? Because, you know, they're going to need the power for the kingdom that needs to come. The kingdom that's coming to this earth. And may I say from, from the day they receive that power to now, just in case I forget it later, that power is not subsided. It's still available to people today. And, I, and it's my firm belief that the powerful power of the gospel with signs, miracles, and wonders is going to take place here in our nation and in our world very quickly. Powerful things are going to happen. They're already beginning to happen. And it, and it just says to me that it has to be God. Because it's not the political party. It's not, I believe we should vote. I believe we should be involved. I believe we should go to school board meetings. We should stand up against the evil that they're trying to snatch our kids away and do all this. But if that's all we do, we're in trouble. But we have power in prayer, first of all. There's power as we pray and we stand against the powers of darkness. That, that people change their minds. People say different things than they thought they were going to say. They don't know why they did it. It's because somebody prayed. <laughs> and God moved on them. And, and, and it, it changed them, made them change their mind. How do you know? You read the Old Testament, wicked kings. God would give them dreams in the middle of the night. Sometimes he'd give them dreams and he wouldn't let them remember what they dreamed. So it just make him all more powerful when he revealed what the dream was plus what it meant. <laughs> Amen. God is still the God who is an all-powerful God. Praise God. He says, you will, see, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. And I want you to know that that's still, that's still for today. When we receive the Holy Spirit and we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, how many know you receive the Holy Spirit when you re receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? You have the Holy Spirit. The baptizing of the Holy Spirit is for power, for power, for witness, for power to reach a world, for power, amen, not to be intimidated by the devil. And we need that power. If Jesus said, listen, he didn't say, okay, guys, I've risen, I died, I rose, now go ahead and take off and start doing it. He said, no, you go and you wait for the power. I wonder if the, if the original apostles who had been with Jesus and had, had seen the demonstrations of power and miracles and signs, I wonder if they needed to wait for the power, how much more would I need to wait for the power before I just take off? <laughs> 
And, and I'm not saying we shouldn't witness or talk to, if we, there's, there's whole denominations, there's people that don't believe in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, they don't believe in speaking in tongues, they don't believe that's, that's what it means, and yet, yet I believe they're saved, they love the Lord, they've, they've done those, but, but listen, we, the church, we individually need power. Just like one of, the, one of the byproducts of my Volkswagen Rabbit that I began to realize, and I had to really concentrate to make myself, I would find myself grinding my teeth trying to make it go faster. It wouldn't go. And I, if I keep this up, I've either got to sell this car and get a different one, or I might not have any teeth left here in a few years or something. But, but there's something, and I, you know, some of you that, that are older, you know, about the hot rod generation, you know, and the, man, there's nothing like those rods or those smoke and fire flames coming out of the pipes, you know, and uh, going up to, to the Seattle International Raceways in those days and watching the drag races, and uh, that, that's kind of what I like, and that's a kind of a power, you know, and you go one to 200 miles in six seconds or so, you know, it's like, wow. <laughs> And uh, I, I had a Mustang, I had a couple of cars that would do that earlier, and, and I gradually got down, down, down to while I was a Volkswagen Rabbit. And I was, but I'm a family man now, I need to take care of my kids. I wanted my kids to be Christian schools, so I, that's part of the, not only just for the church and for the mileage, but that's part of the, of not buying a car or trying to get the best mileage we could because we wanted that. But listen, we need power. When you need it, you need it. Amen. And I want to tell you something. This all-powerful Jesus whom we serve, it says in Acts 2.4, it says, all of them, in Acts 2.4, all of them, say all. All, all of them that went. Now, we, we know that there are around 500 or so that Jesus spoke this word to. He said, go and wait and, and tell your dude with power from on high. They didn't know what was going to happen when they were endued with this power. But, but there, was, there was at least 500 that could have gone. Maybe some of them went somewhere, maybe they're in another upper room or somewhere in another prayer gathering. I don't know, but the scripture doesn't say. It just says basically there's about 120 that went actually as Jesus told them to do. And it says, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that's another message today. I don't want to sidetrack except to say this to you. God... When he fills you and baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, and he gives you that heavenly prayer language, it's not just for a one-time usage. It's not just so you can say, okay, I'm Pentecostal now, I've, I've spoken tongues, and then just go back to your ways. We need to pray in the Spirit. We, need to, we ought to pray in the Spirit every day. You know, the Apostle Paul, whenever he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 12 there, he, he said, I thank my God that I pray in tongues more than you all. And so uh, he was addressing just some issues in the church with how tongues were used in the body of believers as they gathered together. But he said, listen, what was Paul doing? I don't believe he, he was often probably by himself. He's often in a prison cell praying in tongues, praying in the spirit. Amen. And, and uh, the longer you pray in the spirit, let me just tell you something. The more that language will grow, the more it, will, it just becomes full, the more you'll begin to sense the presence and the awareness of God in your life and your heart. The more God will begin to speak to you. Other gifts of the spirit will begin to operate in your lives. The more you pray in the spirit, why won't we do it? That's my question to the church. That's my question to you. That's my question to myself over my lifetime. Why, if we believe this really helps us, Jude says we build up ourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? And so anyway, it says Mark chapter 16, verse 20, the disciples went out. <laughs> they went out and they preached everywhere after this experience. They preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them. <laughs> they say the Lord is looking for people that he can work with. <laughs> He's looking for Christians who will embrace the whole gospel, embrace everything that he has for them. And he wants to work through them and with them. The Lord worked with them and confirmed his word with, uh, with or by signs that accompanied it. <laughs> God wants to confirm his word. He wants us to believe for the miraculous. I know that the miracles draw crowds. And I know that often when you look at Jesus at the end of his ministry, many of those people walked away because they were there for the food. They were there for the miracles. And, and that's right. Yet God still does the miraculous because we need those crowds. And you look at the life of the early church. Every time there was, there was a, uh, an opportunity and a miracle took place and that crowd would gather and then what would they do? They would preach Jesus. They would preach the gospel. They were always preaching Jesus, Jesus crucified, Jesus, the one whom you hung on that cross. Well, 
in Acts chapter 3, they went, and the, the lame man at the gate, beautiful, was laying there, been there for years and years, never walked. From his birth, he was lame. And they said, we don't have any silver and gold, but we have something. <laughs> Because we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Word of God. We have the power of the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. They took him by his hand. And he not only walked, he went leaping and praising God into the temple. And, and uh, people that were lame weren't allowed to go past that gate where he was at. That was where they had to stay. They weren't allowed to go in. He's probably in for the first time inside the temple, the house of God. And so, of course, a crowd gathers. They preach, and ultimately, it says, I think there, if I remember correctly, ultimately about 5,000 people were added to the numbers from that, from that one incident that took place in the preaching. And then there's a day or so there, because the priest came out, and they began to uh, get upset with them and said, Why, what have you preached? How are you doing? By what name? What power? What authority do you do these things? And they said, don't look at us. Don't look at us. I said, we did this. It's not us. It's him. It's him. And so they, the persecution began to come. And so they, they had a prayer meeting. How I many you know when persecution comes, when we have a prayer meeting sometimes, we, we, we pray like, oh, God, I'm being persecuted. Help me, Jesus, to make it through, please. You know, no, here's, here's what. Let's look at Acts chapter 4, verse 29. They're they in the middle of this prayer meeting. And they said, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness stretch out your hand listen lord stretch out your hand to heal and to perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant jesus after they prayed it says the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all a l l there it is again they were all filled with the holy spirit and spoke the word of god boldly <laughs> i mean you know, when you get full of the holy spirit that intimidation that the enemy has will go you'll find yourself speaking if you allow god to fill you He'll give you words to speak that will astound you. You'll th be thinking as they're coming out of your mouth, wow, I didn't know that. I've had that happen in preaching. I've been, in my mind, you, you may not know, it. I'm preaching and saying something that I feel the Holy Spirit just inspired me to say it. I just said it in my mind. said, I hope that's right. I hope that's right. And when I get home, I look, okay, it was right. It was, right. It was okay, you know. But, but we need to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit because people have destinies. People have days of opportunity to come to Christ. And you never know. There's somebody that would never step foot in a church house, but you see them at work. You see them at play. You see them in places around. And if you don't speak to them and say something to them and talk to them about Jesus, they may go out of eternity without ever having anybody even invited them and talk to them about the name of Jesus. It's our responsibility, church. We must be bold. And it says they spoke the word of God boldly. Not just the disciples, I think, but all the people. And all the believers, it says, were in heart, one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. Verse 33, with great what? With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. Wow. <laughs> much grace was upon them all. With great power. And, and I just said, and maybe said again to make sure that we get it this morning. We need that power. We need that powerful gospel. We need people that are full of Holy Ghost power to get this message out. To be bold, to be brazen. Not worry about what they think about you. We're so worried about this, this wokeness stuff. Well, you're going to hurt somebody. What, who's worried about hurting God's feelings? Who's worried about saying something, doing something that would offend God, our maker, our creator, our heavenly father. He's the one we should be worrying about, not whether man gets upset with us or mad with us. Amen? If God says, speak it, speak it. If it's the word of God, speak it. Do it in love, yes, but do it. And, and that's one of the problems we're having. And all that's going on in our nation is so much is being done. All these churches popping up and these new new groups that are saying, well, we're, we're a loving church. We're, we'll embrace whatever your sin is and love you anyway. God died for sinners. He died for all those. But he's still a holy God. He's still a holy God. And he still calls us from darkness into light. Amen. And the more, the longer you live, and the more longer you stay true to God, the more you realize just how much darkness. When I got away from God for a couple of years right out of high school, I didn't realize how dark, how deep I di dived into darkness. I, if you'd asked me, I said, I'm just as close to Jesus. I'm just, I'm just out here messing around a little bit, but I haven't done nothing really bad or anything like that. And, uh, but once I come back to the Lord, I realized, man, I had drifted a long way already. You so quickly can drift off. 
And so we must, we must stay close to the Lord. Well, I, I've got to begin to wrap up here, and that means, uh, that means nothing really, but... <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2, to the church, to the Corinthian church, who had much written to them, two, two uh, books of the Bible written to the Corinthian church. Here's what Paul said, <clears throat> and you, you ought to go read all, a lot of scriptures around this. This is a powerful uh, chapter, especially the first 10 or so verses. Paul says, uh, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. My message, now, now keep in mind, Paul was raised in church, basically, we'd say today. He'd gone to the best seminary. He, he studied under the feet, at the feet of Gamaliel. He, he was a learned man in the Jewish tradition, in the Jewish religion. And so he wasn't just uh, somebody who didn't know anything, but he said, I, 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 uh, he said, my message and my preaching were not with wise, persuasive words. It wasn't me trying to persuade you. <laughs> but he said, but it was with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. Wow. When they had prayed for the man at the gate beautiful and he was miraculously healed and the religious leaders kept first harassing him and said by whose name by what power do you do this in and uh and and, and they say it's not us don't look at uh, don't look at us as if we've done anything it's jesus whom you crucified it's him the living word of god He's the one that this miracle has been wrought by his name and in his name and through his name. And may we say, yes, we always give glory. I, I worry when it seems like some actions happen in, in the pulpit or whether it's a church or whether it's a whatever it might be. When, when we start clapping too much in, for people and for men or when man seems to be receiving glory instead of God, God will not share that his glory with anyone else. It all belongs to him. And they were always careful in the book of Acts. They were always preaching Jesus, but they were always careful to say, it's not, it's not anything that we can do in of ourselves. It's Jesus who lives within us. Uh, he's the one we preach. He's the one who we tell you is doing these things. It's not us. It can't be us. It says, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, <clears throat> but on God's power. I, th I think the reason we have a weak, emaciated church so often today in America and many of our churches is because their faith isn't on the power of God and the Word of God. Their faith is on maybe persuasive ways that they've been swayed or they've been talked to and they've been shared a, a gospel that's not the true gospel. But they came to the Lord, and so that's all they've ever known. They need to know the true gospel. They need to know the call of God to holiness, to purity. Yes, yes, we will make mistakes. Yes, we will fall at times. But we get back up and we repent and we cry out to God. Amen. And we say, For Lord, Lord, forgive me. And he forgives us. And we continue to walk in fellowship with him. And I leave this, that God gives us the power to stop doing those things and not to continue in a life of sin. <clears throat> Now, I, I, I skipped it, but I think I want to do it, then we'll, then we'll close. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Did I, I think I skipped that one, but I want to go back because I'll, I'll just read it and let it, let it speak to you in itself. First Thessalonians 1, verse 4 through 6. He's talking to the church of Thessalonica. Paul says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. Do you see that there? This world today leads a gospel not just with words, but they need that gospel spoken with power. Come to the people we're speaking with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. There needs to be conviction once again in the hearts of people that, that they recognize they're a sinner and they need a Savior, and Jesus Christ is that Savior. He says, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You, beca you became imitators of us and of the Lord, and in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Wow. <clears throat> Praise God. And so I, I, I want to just close today with where we started, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 again. I am not ashamed of the gospel. If we, if we begin to try to change it up just a little bit because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody, did you know that's the devil's work to get people to get us to shut up and to be quiet? 
and to not say what needs to be said. We'll allow people to go to hell in their sin because we don't want to offend them or upset them. If the Word of God offends and upset, so be it. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit that brings true conviction to the heart of people. That it's not just us judging them and saying evil things about it, but it's the Word, it's the powerful Word of God that judges them, judges their sin and says, you need to repent, repent, repent. Everybody that began to preach the gospel in the, in the Psalms, I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, they all were preaching one message. It had, there's different nuances, of course, but everything was always from Jesus to when he sent out the, the 70 uh, to the day of Pentecost. It was all had one element that was always there, repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we still need repentance today. And there's so many that they want a gospel that only blesses them and gives them all the good stuff without turning from their wicked ways. And God says, no, not so. And so I'm just saying that to say this. We need to not be ashamed of the gospel. Speak it, speak it in truth, speak it in love, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentiles. That would be most of us here today, I would assume, the word Gentiles. And he says, listen, it's the power of God. It's the power of God. Not just my words, not just what I say, but I need to preach it, but also need to know him and know the one whom I'm speaking of, because that's where the power comes. Amen. That the power through you and the Holy Spirit working in their life. That's one of the first things the Holy Spirit does. It convicts men of sin. It convicts them of sin and judgment and righteousness to come. And so we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 17, that's not on your PowerPoint either, unless I can put it up there real quick. But verse 17 is what I I finish with today. It says, for the glory, for the for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. I, I want you to remember this. In the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, a righteousness, a righteousness from God is revealed. There's a righteousness that people are purporting today many times, but it's not from God. <laughs> When you start saying it doesn't matter how you live your life and you can live in wickedness and sin, when there's tons of Scripture that says that people live this way, that people that do these things will not see the kingdom of God. They will not enter into heaven. And, and, and one of the things as a pastor in doing funerals, everybody wants their loved one put in heaven. Everybody wants their loved one. It didn't I did a few, I was at a funeral one time, and the pastor, the, the guy who did it, he was the town drunk. He was an alcoholic, and there's been many alcoholics, many drunks that have been saved. He was always doing wicked things, but he was a good artisan. He, he made a sign for the town. Here's the sign. This is our community. And so th he actually died, took out a sheriff's deputy and his dog in a drunken state and crashed into them head, head, head on collision is how he died. But and that whole service, and I, I'm, I, first of all, it's not my job to put anybody in hell. Only God is the judge. Only God knows. Is that correct? Amen. We're agreeing on that. Only God knows the heart of man. And, and yet, yet the preacher put this guy, you'd have thought he was a saint. He's so wonderful. And then they talk about how he's probably up in heaven now doing artwork for Jesus. And, and he may have had time to repent. He may have. We don't know those things. But I'm simply saying this. Not everybody's just going to go to heaven automatically. You have to choose to go to heaven. You have to make a choice. You have to hear the gospel. And you have to make a choice to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And make him the Lord of your life. It's, it's not just even that moment. But it's living and continuing to live for him. And walk with him throughout your life. Amen. So that we can not only begin well. We can end well. <laughs> Amen. And so we need to understand. Everybody says, we're all God's children. Well, God created us all, but we're not all his children. <laughs> you choose to be his child. You choose to walk and say yes to him and come into his marvelous, marvelous light. Well, Father, we just thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for that gospel of the power, the power of God into salvation. And Lord Jesus, today either here in this building or perhaps someone who may watch online or be watching online. Lord, if there's anyone today who has not experienced uh, the power of the gospel of salvation, I pray that today, either this very moment, right where they sit, right where they stand, they may be watching lying in bed this morning. But Lord, I pray, I pray if they're here and they do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior, that today, today they will make that determination to say, Lord, I'm coming home. Forgive me for my sinful life. Forgive me for not accepting your salvation so rich and so free. 
Lord Jesus, I pray that the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, not my words, Lord, I don't have the words to do it, but simply your words, Lord, that I've tried to preach and share this morning. I pray the conviction of the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and our lives. And people receive Christ. And others who have known you, Lord, but they begin to kind of walk just maybe in a little nuance of their life where where the world has kind of infected them a little bit with its ideas. Uh, Lord, to understand that you are a holy God. When we stand around that throne, your elders cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you're a holy God, but you call us to be holy even as you are holy. And so help us, Lord God. We need the power of the gospel. We need the power of the Holy Spirit that breaks the chains of sin, Lord, that breaks the chains of darkness, that breaks every chain, Lord God, and set us free in the name of Jesus.